Hi. Okay, this is podcast number 32. Uh, we're calling this one Robert Mitchum, a very bad boy turned movie star. Now, I had the opportunity to meet him several times. Uh, and before I talk about those opportunities, I would give a little background on him. Um, before he arrived in Los Angeles, uh, found a career in the movie business. He, he was born in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And his dad, who, who worked for the railroad, was crushed in a rail yard accident. And so then uh, Robert Mitchum got sent to some grandparents uh, in uh, Delaware. Now, one of the reasons they sent him to uh, Delaware is because he got kicked out of school in Connecticut for lots of fistfights. Then when he got to Delaware, uh, he beat up the principal. Of course, he got kicked out of that school too. Uh, and that was just the age of 12. At, at the age of uh, 14, uh, he was, uh, again, he, he was riding the rails, going from here to there, uh, kind of like a hobo. And he was arrested in Savannah, Georgia, as a vagrant and put on a chain gang. Well, uh, he, ex he escaped that chain gang and returned to his family in Delaware. Eventually, he rode the rails to California and during World War II, worked for Lockheed Aircraft, uh, and then before easing his way, uh, maybe finding his way into the movie business. Now, Loretta had outlived uh, almost all of her co-stars uh, by the time I met her, and uh, Robert Mitchell was an exception. They appeared together in 1948's Rage of the Stranger. Uh, and they'd remained friends over the decades. Uh, she called him to arrange an inter interview between himself and myself. And uh, I prepared as well as I could, uh, mainly by researching the film's production history. Now, the day before my appointment uh, with Mitchum, there was a print interview with Barbara Walters in the Los Angeles Times, and she was asked to identify her, her toughest interviews. Well, she named two. Uh, one was a rock star whose name I just don't remember, but the other one was Robert Mitchell. And I thought, oh my God, uh, what, what have I gotten myself into? So the next day as I traveled north on, because he lived in Montecito, that's a, really a beautiful area adjacent to Santa Barbara. Um, uh, I was on Highway 101 and I passed this banana plantation that I'd gone by several times. And I stopped and I thought, well, maybe if I bought some kind of exotic uh, kinds of bananas, it would uh, uh, ease my way, get me easier as I got into the door with the Mitchums. So I walked in the door, Mrs. Mitchum answered it, and I handed her the bananas and she just tossed them on a plate with some other fruit, and that was that. Uh, now, I don't know if I said this, but I entered through the kitchen, and it reminded me of the informality of homes uh, that I knew as in my Indiana youth, particularly I lived in a rural community. Everybody came in the back door, and everyone, no one ever went to the front door unless they were strangers. Uh, and then she called out her name cut out his name and hey Bob and that was also like the informality of my youth. A few seconds later, Robert Mitchum was standing in front of me. We shook hands and he asked me to follow him to his den. Now the Mitchum home was quite nice, but I sensed immediately that they prioritized comfort and utility over decor. Uh, for instance, as I passed through the dining room, I noticed that it was lined with overloaded book bookshelves. And I asked Mitchum, who reads all these books? He said, oh, my, my, my wife, Dorothy. Uh, his den was also crowded with bookshelves as well as piles of paper that gave that lived in look that I observed throughout the house. We sat down and started talking uh, about Rachel and the Stranger, uh, the movie he made with Loretta. 
Now, Norman Foster was the director. He was also Loretta's brother-in-law. He was married to her sister, Sally. Uh, now, Robert Mitchum said initially he thought Loretta was a producer because she was kind of so in charge of everything. Uh, he recalled she was very knowledgeable about all the backstage work, the cameras, the lighting. Uh, he said, I suppose it's personal thrift. She just doesn't want to have to do things more than once. Uh, he summed up his working relationship with Loretta and Norman Foster by saying, no, he's summing up Norman Foster's working relationship with Loretta. Uh, he said he was, Norman was very, very conscious, acutely conscious of her approval or disapproval. Uh, whenever he completed a scene, uh, he would look over to gauge her reaction. Now, Mitchin offered a personal insight to Loretta by saying, she projected uh, serenity as she's in control of herself, or at least gives you the impression that she's in control of the circumstances. Now, that control, from his point of view, was her armor. Uh, he continued to say, I should imagine the reason she seeps, keeps herself so collected is because she's so vulnerable. Every once in a while, if things weren't going right, you'd see that vulnerability. Rather than a, say a temper fly, uh, she might become cheerful. He also made the comment that Loretta was as big as any of them, uh, such as Joan or Betty, uh, meaning Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. As enamored as I was with Loretta and her long lasting career, I actually knew better. She may have made more movies than any of those actresses, but at least as the day goes, uh, not many of them are nearly as memorable. Now, as I became more comfortable with Robert Mitchum, uh, I brought up the interview in the previous day's Los Angeles Times. I asked him, why, why had he been so hard on Barbara Walters? He replied, she asked dumb questions. Now, I contrasted his attitude towards Barbara Walters uh, and how gentle he was being with me. And I attributed that uh, to how fond he was of Loretta. Now, we were having our discussions. Mitchum took a call from director Martin Scorsese, uh, known for such intense films as Meat Streets and uh, Taxi Driver. Uh, Mitchum had appeared in the original Cape Fear, and he had agreed to do a cameo in the remake. Incidentally, I saw the remake it featured Robert De Niro and uh, Nick Nolte. Robert De Niro was in the Robert Mitchum role. And the original was so much better hands down. Now, back to my discussion with him in his den. I asked him what it was like to play evil characters. He responded, you know, I've made, I think now it's over 200 films. I only played heavies in two, Cape Fear and Night of the Hunter. Yeah, those are the performances that people remember. Now, I felt my interview had gone well, but I was totally surprised when Mitchell asked me, this is before I left, if I'd like to have lunch with him a few days later in the week. Of course, I said yes. Uh, when I arrived at his house, and before he came to the kitchen to join me, I had the opportunity to ask Mrs. Mitchell, who reads all the books uh, that are just stacked throughout the house. She said, Bob. Then he appeared and we were off. It would be his treat, but he suggested that I drive. Uh, we went to an upscale Mexican restaurant and had a leisurely lunch, uh, leisurely enough for Mitch to have three double margaritas. Uh, their motivation behind his invitation was now apparent. Uh, he was supposed to be on the wagon. Uh, now, I was an keeper, and uh, so I just enjoyed his company. Now, with his lizard-like eyes and his deep voice, he looked and sounded like Robert Mitchum, <clears throat> except he spoke with a vocabulary that belied his tough guy image. Um, I remember her, him referring to somebody as a nosy Parker. Uh, a term straight out of an Agatha Christie mystery novel. 
We also talked about other actors, and he asked me, what actor did I really admire? I, I said, well, I really think Richard Burton is a very good actor. He said, oh, he said, uh, anybody can do that voice. He said, it's just a trick. Uh, and then he proceeded to speak like Richard Burton, and he did sound just like Richard Burton. Uh, later, he did a very impressive Charles Lott. He also mentioned how much he didn't like working with Catherine Hepburn because she was a bossy know-it-all. And he also didn't like Gerd Garson because she acted like she was some kind of royalty. Now, he mentioned uh, he made a movie called River of No Return with um, Marilyn Monroe. And he said, uh, you know, she was lovely, but, but, but like a scared child. Uh, and then he also mentioned that when he worked at uh, Lockheed, uh, you know, before his movie years, uh, he worked with a guy named James Doherty, who was actually Marilyn Monroe's first husband, uh, who she married when he was, she was just 16 years old. Uh, I asked him uh, how actors were so convincing in fistfights uh, that they had on the screen. And he said, well, he said, you know, they're just choreographed. And uh, he looked at me in a way that suggested, why, why don't you already know that? But, but I really didn't. Uh, now, the reason I began this podcast was with, with Mitchell's rocky childhood. It's because I wanted you to see what a smart and sophisticated man he became by the time I met him. That middle school dropout apparently couldn't get his hands on enough books in his adult years. Now, I don't know if it was that day or another time, but uh, he talked about when he and actress, her name was Lila Leeds, had been arrested for marijuana possession. Now, the bust was the result of a sting operation designed to capture uh, him and other Hollywood uh, people. But somehow Mitchum and Leeds didn't get the tip off where the others did. Now, now after serving a week in the county jail, uh, here's the way he put it. Uh, he spent a week in the county jail, and when a reporter asked him about it, he said, it's like being in Palm Springs, but without the riffraff. I thought that was cute. He then spent 43 days in a California prison farm. Now, his popularity with his fans was not harmed, and it was actually enhanced. In fact, they rushed the release of Rachel the Stranger, the, the film he did with Loretta, to take advantage of the publicity. It was a huge box office hit, and RKO's third biggest grossing film of that year. Now, incidentally, uh, during his trial, Loretta functioned as a character witness. Now, if you want to see some great Robert Mitchum films, I recommend the two of which he played a heavy, uh, the aforementioned Night of the Hunter, which incidentally, I just saw last night, it was on TCM, and the original Cape Fear. He really captured what the essence of evil means. Then I'd recommend Out of the Past, a movie he did with uh, Kirk Douglas and Jane Greer, uh, that many consider the ultimate film noir movie. Uh, he also did a couple from Norris with uh, Jane Russell, such as His Kind of Woman and Macau. Uh, and if you're looking for a more noble fare, there's Heaven Knows Mr. Allison and The Sundowners, both with Deborah Carr. And later in his career, he had a huge hit with Ryan's Daughter, uh, which was filmed in Ireland's beautiful Dingle Bay. I know about Dinkle Bay because my mother's family is from Ireland and I traveled through there more than once. Okay. Now, I've read a number of critics who concluded that Robert Mitchum was a hugely underrated actor. Now, this may have been in part because of his casual way of describing his work as just being effortless. Uh, of course, it wasn't. Uh, and when you see either Night of the Hunter or Cape Fear, you'll have to agree that neither of those performances were effortless unless he really was that evil, uh, and, and he clearly wasn't. Uh, also, I asked the writer one time, 
who is the sexiest uh, actor out of all her leading men? And she said it was Robert Mitchum. Uh, now, on the next podcast, I'll talk about going to a birthday party for the show of my Rand, uh, although he was already dead, uh, held at his sister's house. I was seated next to a princess from Egypt. So quite a different experience, again, for this guy from Indiana to walk into. So we'll talk about that next week. Have a good week yourself. Bye-bye.